welcome to True Crime IRL, true crime in real life. I'm your host, Kelly Barron's Brink. Ireland's most shameful secrets. We treated women exceptionally badly. 39-year-old father Gilbert Gothe has admitted that he sexually abused at least 35 boys. The remains of many, from babies to three-year-olds, thought to be buried under the ground in a sewage tank. Brother Williams would call boys up to stand next to him behind his desk. Les says Brother Williams then put his hand up the leg of their shorts. 9,000 babies died in 18 religious institutions over several decades. We did this to ourselves as a society. Imagine growing up in a time and a place where women are second-class citizens and sexuality is not only a taboo topic, but exposing the fact that you've been sexually active will get you socially ostracized, locked up, and possibly even killed. Fornicating outside of marriage is a mortal sin, and even if you are a rape victim as young as 12 or 13 years old, well, it's your fault. You brought this on yourself by being a sinner and a whore. You have no reproductive or other basic human rights. You're only here to marry and be a wife and a mother, and follow the rules. And if you do break the rules, if you have sex before you're married, and God forbid you get pregnant, which is very likely because there's no such thing as birth control and no such thing as abortion, well, you're sent away to a prison to be enslaved against your will with thousands of other girls to an institution where you and your child will be starved and abused and eventually... If you don't die first of malnutrition and illness, your baby will be taken from you and sold to the highest bidder. You'll be told a story such as, sorry, your baby died, even if they didn't, and you can't search for your child because you're not allowed to leave your prison walls until you pay off your room and board debts with continued years of slave labor. Years later, when you do actually get thrown back into society with a scarlet letter on your forehead, you try to search for your child, but you have no resources to do so because you're told no records exist, that they were destroyed or misplaced over time, or what records you are given have been falsified by higher powers. Maybe, just maybe, your baby really did die. And if they did, their body was dumped into a mass grave that doubles as a deep sewage tank, discarded like trash, along with hundreds of other little bodies, stacked one on top of another, on top of another, crammed into a hole into the ground until no more children's corpses could fit. Am I talking about a new season of The Handmaid's Tale or American Horror Story? A new science fiction movie about a cruel, futuristic, dystopian society? Maybe some horrible, vicious underground cult? No. I'm talking about one of the largest child trafficking organizations of the 20th century, otherwise known as the Catholic Church. This is the story of Ireland's Catholic mother and baby homes that operated between the 1920s and the 1990s. Hey everyone, welcome back to True Crime IRL. I'm your host, Kelly Barron's Brink. And today we're going to delve a little deeper into the Catholic Church crimes and conspiracies. And we're going across the pond to one of the most Catholic nations on the planet, Ireland. The Emerald Isle is known for its sweeping green landscapes, festive traditional music, friendly, genuinely wonderful people, and good beer. You'll have a hard time finding anyone who has traveled to Ireland and come home with negative things to say about this wonderful country. Some of my favorite people are from Ireland, and that makes today's story all the more difficult to talk about. There's a deep, dark part of Ireland's not-so-distant past that its people have tried hard to forget about, 
because it's a story of pain and heartache imposed upon the people of Ireland by their government and the church that they were so loyal to. Last week, we chatted with Tom Hogan, author of the book The Empty Confessional, which is a great crime fiction book loosely based on some of Tom's insider knowledge of the Catholic Church that he gained in seminary, studying to become a priest. Now, his book is definitely a work of fiction, but Tom is also a professor of religion and a recovering Catholic, so his real-life experiences are very present in his writing. It was a great conversation to kick off this multi-part series that I'll be doing on the crimes, corruption, and conspiracies inside the Catholic Church behind those Vatican walls. The Catholic Church is one of the oldest, wealthiest, and most powerful institutions in the world. With all that money and power, like any other huge organization, you'll find greed, corruption, cover-ups, and criminal activity. Now, you've all heard of the Catholic priest pedophilia crimes. We've all heard those stories in the news. But in these next few episodes, I'm going to share some other stories with you that you may not have heard of, including the one I'm discussing today, how the Catholic Church became one of the largest child trafficking rings of the 20th century. It seems unbelievable, but the stuff I'm going to be talking about today is verifiably true. It really happened. It's a dark part of Ireland's history that many don't want to and won't believe, but it's a fact. So for today's episode, we'll be hopping across the pond, and I'm going to get right into the story after this. To fully understand Ireland's network of mother and baby homes, we have to go all the way back to the early days of Ireland, when it was ruled by the British. In 1916, Ireland received their freedom from Britain, but just because they were freed from British rule did not mean that the Irish were truly free, because the Catholic Church then basically stepped in to govern the country. Catholic leaders wanted Ireland to be seen as a pillar of purity and morality. Sex education in Ireland was completely non-existent and forbidden. All contraception was banned, and abortion was highly illegal. But like any other place, that didn't mean that the people of Ireland stopped doing what came naturally to all humans, having sex. They just tried to hide it, and nobody talked about it. But it's hard to ignore sexual promiscuity when a young pregnant mother is standing in front of you with a swollen belly and nowhere to go. When a young woman, or should I say a girl, because many of these victims were just children themselves at just 13, 14, 15, teenagers. But when they would get pregnant, it was not received well by their family. In fact, it was seen as the most disgraceful thing that could fall upon a family, regardless of the situation involved, whether it was rape, abuse, incest, or even if it occurred in a healthy, loving relationship. If a woman fell pregnant outside of marriage, she was labeled as a whore as immoral and an embarrassment to those around her, and not only to their immediate families, but to the country and to the church. Ireland and the Catholic Church did not embrace unwed mothers and illegitimate children, and they wanted to hide away the fact that anyone in their country could have possibly been engaging in sexual activity outside of marriage because that was a huge sin. And this is where the Irish mother and baby homes came into play. These were institutions where unmarried women and girls were sent when they became pregnant, with the promise of room and board, help with giving birth, and a safe place to stay while they got back on their feet again. On the outside, most of these buildings were grand and beautiful. This seemed like it would be a second chance at life again in a difficult situation for women who had few opportunities and had been shunned by their family. But this was all a lie. On the inside, it was a living hell. What really happened is that these pregnant young women and girls would be charged basically with a crime, and their sentence was, well, prison. Forced slave labor as penance for their fornication. They'd be sent to a mother and baby home. These homes were partially funded by the state and the Catholic Church, and they were run by nuns from the church. 
One of the most notorious mother and baby homes was in Toome in County Galway. This is the main subject of the new topic documentary called The Missing Children. It's a true crime story that exposes the Catholic Church's involvement in the trafficking, neglect, and suspicious deaths of babies born to unwed mothers in Ireland. I'll link to the documentary in the show notes. And if you're interested in this story, I highly recommend watching the topic documentary. The nuns ruled the tomb mother and baby home with an iron fist. They imposed a life of backbreaking work for these young women housed here. The sisters in charge of the home described the young unwed mothers as having committed a mortal sin, and they put them on the same level as murderers. The church despised them. When a woman gave birth in the facility, they would often be strapped down to a table and forced to give birth with no pain medication whatsoever. No pain medication, even if they needed more invasive procedures during labor and delivery. If the young mother in labor screamed too much out of pain, she would be locked outside in an outhouse where her screams during labor and childbirth would not be heard. The sisters in charge would insult them and taunt them as they laid on the table, telling them that they deserved to feel this horrible pain as a punishment for their sins, that they deserved to suffer because they were impure adulterers and whores. If the young mother was lucky, she would be allowed to spend a day or two with her newborn while she recovered, but very quickly the visits would become less frequent, only being allowed to have their babies to breastfeed them, and then they would quickly be taken away again. But quite often, they wouldn't see their baby ever again. They would be told that their baby had died, or that the child was stillborn. And often that was true. With such minimal health care during pregnancy and such a hostile, stressful environment, there were often complications during birth that would be ignored by the nuns. It was common for mothers and babies not to survive childbirth in these places. To the Catholic nuns overseeing these institutions, the death of a child and their mother meant one less mouth to feed, one less sinner to care for. To the nuns, the young mothers were insignificant criminals and deadbeats. Their babies were fatherless bastards who were doomed to a life of poverty and destitution. But most of these mothers and babies did make it through childbirth. And when they did, the mothers were given a couple days of rest after giving birth. And then it was right back to hard manual labor. And this is graphic, but, you know still bleeding and still with fresh stitches, engorged breasts, and absolutely exhausted and in pain from the birthing process. And any of you who have given birth, you know how those first couple days feel after you've had a baby. Can you imagine being on your hands and knees for hours a day scrubbing floors or all day long on your feet working in the kitchen or washing laundry by hand just days after giving birth when all you yearn for is to cradle your brand new infant in your arms. That's the soul-crushing reality that occurred behind the stone walls run by the Catholic Church. When their time was up in these places, which could be between one and three years after having their child, and after they had officially paid off their debts with hard manual labor, they were cast out into society without their babies. They were not allowed to take their children with them. Now, if they had money, they could pay the church to get out of prison. But if they had money, they wouldn't be there in the first place. So they would stay there, incarcerated for years, until the church let them go. Often, the sisters of the home would force women to sign away their parental rights under duress. But frequently, they would actually forge the mother's signatures and literally steal their children from them. Or, like I said before, they'd lie to them and say that their child had died and send them out on the streets after they had paid their dues. Inside the mother and baby home, there was an orphanage run by the nuns where the children would go after their mothers were forced to leave. I call it an orphanage, but really, it was more of a disgusting, evil baby factory where children were disposable. Thousands of children came and went through Ireland's mother and baby homes in the years they operated. The government would contribute sufficient amounts of money to the institutions to provide adequate food, clothing, medicine, and things like that to the children in need, but that money did not go to the children. 
most of it went into the Catholic Church's pockets. While the nuns of the homes ate well, were nourished, and healthy, the children there were basically starved. All of them were skinny, malnourished, and sick. Skin infections were rampant among these little ones, and they were denied basic health care and medications as a way to save money and turn a profit. Witnesses would state that the cries of hungry children constantly echoed through the building, and when they did eat, it really didn't do a lot of good as these kids were already so sick that they suffered from terrible diarrhea that ravaged their little bodies, making them weak and miserable. And then there was the abuse. Mothers and children alike were given harsh beatings and physical punishments inside these walls. Many were sexually abused by workers and priests inside the facilities. So in the mid-20th century, World War II brought 300,000 American soldiers into Northern Ireland. And very quickly, they noticed that there was an abundance of orphans living there. These children were an unfortunate byproduct of Ireland's conservative Catholic views. They were basically trash that they were more than happy to dispose of. And with that, the Catholic Church saw an excellent and easy opportunity to make money here. So in America, there was a high demand for white babies to adopt. Ireland's huge population of white orphans solved a problem for Caucasian American families and for the Catholic Church. The families would get a baby and the church would get money. Americans flocked to Ireland in droves to buy babies from Catholic orphanages. Every week, hundreds of Irish babies at a time were exported out of the country by plane to the United States. They were a commodity for the Catholic Church in what was one of the largest child trafficking rings in the history of the world. American families gave huge sums of money to the church in what they called donations in exchange for children, most of whom were taken without the consent of their Irish mothers. These children's records would be manipulated with forged signatures and fraudulent paperwork. Many of these children who were illegally adopted were the ones whose mothers were told that their babies had died. The nuns would actually lie to the birth mother, say their baby was dead, forge a death certificate, and then turn around and forge an adoption certificate for that very same child and sell that baby to an American family in exchange for a large sum of money. But of course, this was for the living children. Maybe we could call them the lucky ones because many babies did not survive the brutal conditions inside these Catholic institutions. Although the Catholic Church was raking in a lot of money between selling the babies, getting free slave labor from the unwed mothers, and then cutting costs by starving and neglecting those in their care, the children never saw a dime of that money. The living conditions stayed as horrendous as they were no matter how much money sat in the Catholic Church bank accounts. The kids and their mothers starved. Their skeletal, sick little bodies withered away until many of them perished. And when I say many of them, I'm talking about thousands. It's estimated that around 1,000 babies and toddlers died just in the tomb, mother, and baby home alone during its years of operation. A child from the home died every couple weeks from 1925 to 1961, and the rampant deaths raised no flags for anyone. And that's because everybody looked the other way. And across Ireland, around 9,000 babies died in the church-run mother and baby homes. And remember, this was in the 20th century in an industrialized nation that had, at the time, access to food, medicine, government aid, and everything it really needed to prevent this from happening. So the official teachings of the Catholic Church oppose all forms of abortion, saying that, and I quote, human life must be respected and protected absolutely from the moment of conception. From the first moment of their existence, a human being must be recognized as having the rights of a person, among which is the right to life. The hypocrisy of that statement is summed up in how they treated unwed mothers and their innocent babies. Obviously, that's a lot of death happening in those institutions, and that's a lot of funerals, and it necessitates a lot of cemetery space. 
They must have been having weekly religious ceremonies for these unfortunate little souls who perished in their care, and they must have had a place to go with these children when they died, right? Well, not exactly. Between 1961 and 1972, the mother and baby home in Tum was closed and demolished to make room for the construction of a new housing development on the land. And in 1975, stories, sounding really more like urban legends, started surfacing from local kids who were playing and claimed to have stumbled upon a concrete sewage pit containing tiny little human skeletons. Of course, this sent these kids running for home, stunned by what they were seeing. Adults, including the Catholic Church leaders, brushed off these findings, saying that the skeletons were probably from much further back in the past, when disease and famine was common in Irish villages. Nobody looked into it. A priest came to bless the ground, a memorial garden was erected, and that was it. Everyone carried on. Except the women whose lives were destroyed in these facilities. They could not carry on. Then in 2012, a local historian in County Galway, Catherine Corliss, published an article about Ireland's tragic history of mother and baby homes and the high infant mortality rate inside these facilities. She discovered that in tomb of the hundreds of infants who died, there were no death certificates and no burial records. Nothing. So where did these children go? Where did they end up? Why was there no information available? Catherine Corliss spent thousands of dollars of her own money to launch her own personal investigation into the deaths of the tomb babies and toddlers. The media would get wind of this, as well as the Irish government, and they too launched their own investigations. What they would all eventually conclude was that the Sisters of Bon Secours, the nuns who ran the tomb mother and baby home, disposed of hundreds of bodies of deceased babies and toddlers in an old sewage tank on the property. Massive amounts of tiny skeletons, one on top of the other on top of the other, shoved into this concrete chamber of horrors over many years. These leaders in the Catholic Church, the same church that claims to value the sanctity of all human life, dumped these little children into a sewage tank. They treated them like actual garbage. Waste. No dignified burial for these kids. No legal death certificates or documentation. No records of burial, we know now, because they really couldn't record a sewage tank on a burial record. The work of one woman using her own money, her own time, and resources is what brought attention to the travesty of the mother and baby homes in Ireland. Without the work of Catherine Corliss, this would have been a time in history that nobody would have ever shed light on. She worked tirelessly to give these babies back their names. One by one, she obtained the real paperwork for these children and found out every one of their true identities. In 2021, the Irish government issued an apology over the appalling level of infant mortality identified in their investigative report. Their inquiry concluded that about 9,000 children died in 18 institutions under investigation. About 15% of all the children who lived in Ireland's mother and baby homes died in those homes. The Irish Prime Minister admitted in a statement, quote, we had a completely warped attitude to sexuality and intimacy, and young mothers and their sons and daughters were forced to pay a terrible price for that dysfunction. End quote. The Coalition of Mother and Baby Home Survivors says, quote, This report is fundamentally incomplete as it ignores the larger issue of the forced separation of single mothers and their babies since the foundation of the state as a matter of state policy. The Sisters of Bon Secours, who ran the tomb facility, offered their profound apologies to all the women and children who lived at the tomb home, their families, and to the people of Ireland. The order admitted that its nuns, quote, did not live up to our Christianity when running the home. We acknowledge in particular that infants and children who died at the home were buried in a disrespectful and unacceptable way. For all that, we are deeply sorry, end quote. Survivors of the mother and baby homes are happy that they're now being acknowledged. But what the church and government are doing to redress their torture of women and children is not enough. 
Lives were ruined, not just in their time where they were locked up, but for generations beyond that. Ireland's most vulnerable people were locked away from society. All of their most basic human rights were stripped from them. They were hidden and forgotten about, and they deserve reparations. One interesting thing to note here is that 14 nuns passed away throughout the time that the tomb mother and baby home was open. The Irish are typically very respectful of the dead and of the burial process. The nuns who died there were honorably buried in a cemetery on the grounds. Years after that, when the nuns moved off the tomb property, they spent a great deal of money having their deceased sisters exhumed, moved off the land, and reburied in a new cemetery, sacredly, respectfully, and properly. They found the Catholic nuns worthy of this respect, but not those babies. So do Catholics really believe all life is sacred? You be the judge of that. Only after the Catholic Church and the Irish government were publicly outed for these atrocities were any investigations launched or any apologies made. But they, internally, knew what they were doing all along. By all appearances, they saw nothing wrong with how they ran these mother and baby homes in the 20th century. What if nobody had ever stumbled upon those hundreds of tiny skeletons in the sewer pit? What if none of the former young mothers had come forward then? Would they still be sorry? Would they still have apologized? And are they sorry for what they did? Or are they sorry they got caught? The Irish government and the Catholic Church oppressed the people of Ireland, especially the women, for hundreds of years. And only now are people speaking out against the misogynist values. Just as recently as the mid to late 20th century, have Irish women been given any rights at all, including the right to work outside the home, to divorce, and to make decisions regarding their own bodies and their own health. Ireland is a beautiful place with kind-hearted and wonderful people who are trying to heal from the hardships and the brutal sadness and heartbreaking mistakes from the past. The survivor stories of the mother and baby homes in Ireland are still unfolding. A lot of this is just now coming to light. People are finally starting to speak out about how their lives were destroyed in those years. And like I said, the church and the government are talking about reparations being made, but will it ever be enough? Next week, I will be talking to a survivor of one of Ireland's largest mother and baby homes, and you are not going to want to miss her story. If you or anyone you know has been negatively impacted by abuse within the Catholic Church, there are a few resources available to you, and I will list them in the show notes. First, if you're in Ireland, you can search for the Coalition of Mother and Baby Home Survivors, or CMABS. They can be found on Facebook. You can also Google an organization called Beyond Adoption. And then there is SNAP, which is the Survivors Network of Those Abused by Priests, and it can be found at snapnetwork.org. Like I said, next week I will be talking to a survivor and I will be going further down the rabbit hole of Catholic Church crimes and conspiracies. You're not going to want to miss it, so tune in next week. Until then, lock your doors, people. Bye-bye. True Crime IRL is written, produced, and hosted by Kelly Barron's Brink. Please subscribe to True Crime IRL wherever you get your podcasts and consider leaving a five-star review. Go to truecrimeirl.com for more information. Support the show by becoming a Patreon donor. Go to patreon.com slash truecrimeirlpodcast. You can also support the show by leaving a tip in the TCIRL tip jar. Go to truecrimeirl.com and click on the donate button. Or buy merch in the TCIRL merch shop truecrimeirl.com slash merch. Watch True Crime IRL on YouTube at youtube.com slash kellybrinktv. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at True Crime IRL, all one word. True Crime IRL theme music is produced by the captain at True Crime Garage. Hi everybody. Hi, everybody. This is Bo. And this is Adam. Thank you for listening, listening to, to our mom's podcast. podcast.
true crime IRL. If you're obsessed with murder shows like your mom, you can support the podcast by going to Patreon and becoming a member. Just go to patreon.com slash true crime IRL podcast. It helps your mom pay all the bills and buy us new shoes. Lock your doors, people! Just lock them. Bye-bye.